2007 meeting to order. Will you all please stand to say the Pledge of Allegiance with me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Can you please call the roll? Councilmember Barnwell? Here. Balcone? Here. Horton? Here. House? Here. Schneider? Williams? Mayor Bloom? Here. Item 1, Employee Recognition Service Award Pins. Come on up. Hi. You're first. <laughs> You've had, here's your pin. Don't leave. I've got something more here. 35 years of service. It's amazing. It's good. Victor Acosta began his career with the city of Santa Barbara on July 1st, 1971, when he was hired as a temporary plant operator, one. On August 16th, 1972, he was hired as a permanent employee in the position of sewage plant operator, one. Victor was quickly promoted through the ranks and by November of 1980, he attained the top job at the treatment plant, wastewater superintendent. Victor started work for the city before the current El Estero treatment plant was constructed. He was present throughout the construction period and lead plant staff in starting up and operating the new treatment plant. This period of Victor's career was characterized and marked by 12 to 18 hour days. Start, uh, the, um, the wealth of knowledge gained by Victor during the construction and startup of the plant continues to be an asset to plant employees. Victor has overseen many upgrades and improvements at the treatment plant, including the construction of the recycled water plant and desalination plant, and Victor's outstanding work has been recognized and acknowledged by his supervisors in numerous commendations. Victor holds a grade five license as wastewater treatment plant operator, this is the highest level of certification. Victor has been an active member of the California Water Environmental Association, which is the professional association for those in the wastewater industry. He has served as the chair of the local chapter and has received numerous awards for his service. Victor and his wife, Gloria, have been married 34 years. They have three children, Cynthia, Priscilla, and Victor, and five grandchildren, all of whom reside locally. Victor, it's my privilege to honor you today on your 35th anniversary. Congratulations. <laughs> Mayor and City Council members, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for inviting me. And for presenting me with this wonderful proclamation, I very much appreciate this honor. These past 35 years as an employee of the City of Santa Barbara have been very challenging at times, especially when dealing with environmental laws that are enforced by the EPA, Air Pollution Control District, State Waters Control Board, and other local and statewide environmental groups. I also want to extend my appreciations to all the staff at the Alistair Wastewater Treatment Plant, the dedication and loyalty of the plant operators, maintenance and laboratory technicians, collection systems, personnel, office and pre-treatment staff have made Alistair an enjoyable, an enjoyable and interesting place to work. I also would like to acknowledge the support of my family, especially during the occasional stressful times at work without their constant, uh, constant support these 35 years of service will probably not have been as enjoyable. In closing, I'd like to thank you again for presenting me this with this award. I would also like to remind you that while the wastewater treatment act section may not be as glamorous or recognizable as the police and fire department, it can take only a single flush <laughs> of a toilet or one backup sewer to know that we're there <laughs> to protect the environment and preserve the, uh, preserve the environment and prevent our creeks and oceans from being contaminated. Once again, I thank you. I also, yes, I also like to introduce my family, and there's another new, another grandson coming up real soon. Uh, that's my family back there. 
And the one I call my, 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 my second family is way in the back. <laughs> Thank you, people I work with. Thank you. Daniel McCarter began his career as a firefighter for Ventura County Fire Department in Newberry Park, California. Daniel was hired on August 16, 1982 by the City of Santa Barbara Fire Department. Five years later, he was promoted to engineer, and in April 1999, he was promoted to captain. Daniel has functioned as an instructor for several of the recruit academies. He was a member of the Hazardous Materials Team for 15 years and has worked at stations 1, 2, 3, and is currently working at station 7 on the C shift. Daniel has received commendations for his field observer skills and attention to detail during the day fire in 2006, an exemplary action report for his engine company's quick response to protect residents during the Cerrito fire. And in 1992, he was named Firefighter of the Year by the Veterans of Foreign Wars. Before joining the City of Santa Barbara Fire Department, he has also served in the U.S. Army as a Special Forces Combat Engineer. Daniel enjoys a very active personal life and is an avid sailor and hiker. He and his wife, Sarah, have been married for 14 years and have two children, son Aiden, 13, and I believe right there, and daughter, Julia, 9 years old. Daniel, it's a pleasure to honor you today for your 25 years of service with the City Fire Department. On behalf of the City Council and your fellow citizens, we thank you and congratulate you on this momentous occasion. going to accept this and sneak away, but I was talked into a speech, and so here it is. <laughs> Madam Mayor, members of City Council, um, thank you for recognizing my 25 years of community service. I was hired by the city in August 1982, along with two other candidates, Jan Svensson, an Olympic athlete, and Meredith Watson, now a fire captain for Truckee Fire Department. In an occupation dominated by males, I was the first male minority in a Santa Barbara City Fire Academy class. In the last 25 years, this department has participated in many significant events. Two war fires, the Sea Cliff incident, the Rodney King riots, Northridge earthquake, Malibu fires, Painted Cave fire, La Conchita landslide, numerous floods, and the loss of one of our own, Steve Masto. I've seen many changes in 25 years here. More female firefighters from one when I came on to six until uh, we just, one just retired. Um, from seven stations to eight stations, now including the airport. Station four moved to, from De La Vina Street to Onterre. Station two moved from Haley to Cacique Street. Remodels at station six and station five. Station 3 traded an arch for a square-shaped apparatus door to accommodate a bigger new fire engine, which was, is just three inches of clearance on the sides um, and one inch above the light bar. We have gone from riding tailboard on engine 7 to enclosed air-conditioned cabs. This department has progressed from hazmat pickup truck to the envy of the modern world, a state-of-the-art, bigger than the biggest multifunction hazmat apparatus with all the bells, whistles, lighting, and air. Yet the biggest change came not from bigger but smaller, the computer, which I was told would make hard copy obsolete. Before the computer, I remember watching Chief Vaughn document in a large red log book with a print so perfect that even today's computer cannot compare. <laughs> We are today better prepared to handle more types of incidents using more sophisticated equipment, all requiring more technical knowledge, and yet one thing has stayed the same, the firefighter. Many are newer, faster, smarter, stronger, quicker, and younger, but all have the thing that never changes, heart. They give and they keep giving. They give to each other and they give to the community 24-7, 365 days a year. I'm honored and privileged to be 
a Santa Barbara City firefighter. Thank you again for recognizing my 25 years of service and thank you for your continued support for your firefighters. Yes, Madam Mayor, the other employees who are receiving service award pins this month include Michelle DeCant, who also has 25 years, and she's an administrative analyst in community development. With 20 years, Andrea Bifano, who's a senior rental housing mediation specialist in community development. Catherine Hennebree, who's administrative specialist in police. James Ward, senior electronics communication technician in public works. With 15 years, also from the fire department, Steve Espinoza, who's a fire captain. With 10 years, Randy Ward, who's public works inspector two in public works. And with five years, Yvette Waugh, engineering tech in public works. Andrew Rhodes, water treatment plant control operator in public works. And Jeff Schultz, who's a waterfront maintenance worker in the waterfront. Thank you. Item two, letter of recognition for the 70th anniversary of the Santa Barbara Lawn Bowls Club. Arise. <laughs> there you go. You want to come on up? You're going to be accepting? Yeah. This, thank you. All of you together, maybe. The ancient sport of lawn bowls has been played by men and women of all ages in the thir since the 13th century. Bowling on the green provides healthy competition, mental stimulation, and social interaction for citizens of all ages. Santa Barbara Lawn Bowls Club was established in 1937 and has been sponsored by the Santa Barbara City Parks and Recreation Department ever since. The 70th anniversary occurs on August 11, 2007. Through the combined efforts of club members and the City of Santa Barbara, the club has offered countless hours of enjoyment to thousands of players and their guests. So we're going to hereby recognize the Santa Barbara Lawn Bowls Club um, as it celebrates 70 years of providing opportunities to members of the community and encourage citizens to avail themselves of the opportunities offered by both Lawn Bowls clubs to learn this fine game and to enjoy the physical, mental, and social benefits that it provides. Thank you very much. Congratulations. First of all, I'd like to say I'm the president. My name is Lee Smeads, and this is my wonderful vice president, Carol Smith, and then the fellow that's putting together this big bash on Saturday, which all of you have been invited to, and you might even get a chance to bowl. <laughs> we had one of the, uh, rec the Parts and Recreation Commission members uh, agree to bowl and bring his wife. So we hope you'll do it. And then I want to introduce to you George Glarum, who's the chairman of our 70th anniversary and has worked real hard to put a rip doozer of a program together. And I'd like to say also, instead of painting the city blue, we'd like to paint it red next Saturday. Okay. So Good. come. <laughs> thank you very much. Now, you want to say a word, too? Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you for all of the club and the interest you have and the partnership we have with the city to provide recreation. Good. Thanks again. See you on Saturday, huh? Yes. Mr. What, what is the time on Saturday? What time well, of day? Well, we're going to eat at uh, 2, 2.30, but we're going to have fun before that. So we're going to start the tournament uh, at um, maybe if you got there at 10 o'clock, we're going to bowl. And then, then we're going to have a fun game right after the tournament bowling, which everybody is to participate, including you. And it doesn't oh, take yeah. any skill, so that, that <laughs> helps. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. And this you. is downtown. Because this is on Saturday of this week. Is it the downtown bowling? Or is, is it at Dale up Vina. downtown? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Great. It's the it's the Santa Barbara Lawn Bowls Club. Right. There is another club in the Up city, starts. but I, I kind yeah. of I can't forgot the, the name. name. Yeah. So. I know. <laughs> Ladies, if you will, flat sole shoes, we'd appreciate it. Okay. If we want to get you out on the green and we'll put bowls in your hands. I think you'll have a wonderful time. Great. Mm -hmm. Thanks again, all. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. I would advise you to come around 1230 because okay. that's when the program gets going and uh, we'll, <laughs> we'll, uh, we want you all there. You hear? Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Glarm. Thank you. Hmm. Okay. Changes to the agenda. I think we want to put.
We wanted yeah, to Madam hear Mayor, from the After the chief. other public comments, I'd like okay. to ask, I've asked uh, Chief Prince to give you a brief update on the Zaka fire. Good, good, okay. I know several of us have been briefed, but it's good to get the latest. Thank you. Um, we have public comment. Wayne Scholes will be followed by Ken Locke. Yes, hi. I'm here just like I was in September to complain about the lack of progress, the lying and the arrogance by Browning Allen and the Transportation Department towards the improvement, some safety and pedestrian safety and speed control on shoreline. In September, when Doss had him come to explain himself for his lack of progress, he told everybody they'd had problems, but it'd be completed in June. It was never completed in June. I've met with Browning several times and talked to him, but the only time I get a hold of him is when I threaten to come down here and tell the council that he's lying again. I've made three phone calls Friday. I made one phone call Friday, two today to that department, try to get a hold of him. I know he was out of town Friday. He was here yesterday, and he's here today, and I've not received any phone calls back. And I'd like to get the rest of the city council to get involved in this so we can get this finished and completed. We were promised this almost two years ago. And in the same period of time, the city has found the money to replace the garbage cans on Shoreline Park, which they're doing right now at a cost of $1,633 per garbage can, which at approximately 25 garbage cans comes to a total of $40,000 and change, plus another $10,000 for installation. We're talking about $50,000 that the city found money to spend so that we could have pretty garbage cans on Shoreline Park. But so far, all we've gotten for our improvements is a painted sidewalk or crosswalks. And that was only the very next day after I was here in September. So if any of you would like to talk to me, you can get my phone number from DOS. I'm sick and tired, and everybody else that's on our petitions, DOS has the petitions, the Transportation Department has it. Seventy-eight people were, in the last, were at the last meeting. And every day, everybody asks me what I found out and what's going on about this. And I keep telling them, DOS is involved. Nobody else has been. I keep getting a hold of Browning Allen. He tells me things that turn out to not be true. And the answer from the general public is, yeah, we're just being lied to again. If we can spend $1,633 for each garbage can in Shoreline Park, the city council ought to be able to find enough time to get a hold of Browning Allen and tell him to make pedestrian and traffic safety a number one priority. We had one death up on Cliff Drive recently. We had another vehicle drive right through a house. Luckily, nobody was in there. People are speeding constantly on shoreline, and we have very little police activity up there because they're so involved with trying to suppress the gang activity for Fiesta. So I would appreciate any of your Involvement in this so far, DOS has been the only one that has. If you don't think the public safety is more important than pretty garbage cans, then I would suggest you guys step down in the next election or the public vote you out. Thank you. Thank you. Ken Locke will be followed by Phil Walker. My name is Kenneth Locke. Um, claiming to be a renaissance genius. Uh, if you go in the search engine like MSN, I think I'm number three if you put the words renaissance genius. Um, the genius of the philosophy of aesthetics that includes the fine arts or arts, painting. I explained the whole basis of the complete history of the abstract art movement of the 20th century. Um, also in relation to athletics through tennis. I shared a page with you called uh, the genius of tennisance. And uh, in that, I uh, explain the fact that when you do have a genius, then you have the ability to uh, recognize and determine a, a, an individual's level of intelligence based on who they actually refer to as a genius. Now, what I'm claiming to be is the genius of tennis in relation to it being an ambidextrous, non-competitive relationship. Um, and if they would refer to somebody who's ambidextrous, non-competitive, I would be the genius. But a person could refer to the likes of a Roger Federer, and uh, he's a genius in relation to one arm, based on the fact it's competitive. It's, it's at a lower level of integration, a lower level of intelligence. Um, in, that, in this page, again, I, I mentioned that, that whole concept. Uh, your uh, intelligence in relation to art, and uh, you know, the prime example, the, the light blue line, 
is based on a, a lack of intelligence, a, a lack of integrity. Um, you, you do not have a, a, a grasp on art history. Um, I know that because, again, I'm claiming to be the genius, the one who finished and completed that history. So it would require you to actually recognize me and that achievement before you actually start accumulating knowledge which is actually worth keeping. Uh, I do make myself available to this community, as I mentioned uh, in the years past. And uh, if there's any uh, communication, you can get me through my email. Thank you. Thank you. Phil Walker. And then the last one will be Rick Goodfriend. Madam Mayor and City Council, it's good to see you again. Uh, one postscript to Victor Acosta as well. Victor is not a very outspoken man, but he's been an excellent boss, my boss for almost 26 years. I've known the man for, oh, since 1966 when we both wound up in the U.S. Army, but we worked at uh, the old Valley House restaurant. It became, uh, I think, uh, I can't remember the name of the restaurant. There's been several restaurants since then, but Victor is a quiet man that uh, been an excellent boss, so he he's, doesn't jump to conclusion, he's smooth. You couldn't ask for a more uh, honorable man, too. Also, it's good to know that Victor is a decorated Vietnam vet. Uh, he's been awarded the Purple Heart, uh, I think a Bronze Star for Valor, too, and several other decorations. I mean, he's quite a man. He's been there and done it. Now I'm going to change pace here. As you all well know, there's smoke is blowing that way, but there's still considerable drift smoke, high altitude from the Zaka fire. From about 1922 to 32, there were four fires in the Gibraltar drainage that I think they comprised uh, approximately 64 square miles. Zaka fire is now at 109 square miles. In the period up to about 1941, as I remember, uh, Gibraltar lost about 50% of its capacity through siltation. Granted, today I think most of the, the siltation will be scoured out if we do get the intense rains sometime after the fire. It might be a dry year. We might get 100 inches. Who knows? It's all speculative. That siltation will pass on through to Kachuma. So eventually you're going to lose capacity if more capacity that has been lost in Kajuma. Again, I'm bringing up the subject of the desal plant. Let's get a couple steps closer to turning on the key. Why not even opt to uh, put two more stacks of fuel cells at El Estero to power the thing with, or partially power? You can solarize it. Your shallow groundwater basins here and the fuel cell are the only truly sustainable water resources in the city itself, plus the uh, recycle plant. The water okay. that's expropriated from the San Inez drainage through the, the water tunnels is taken from a drainage outside the geographical limits of the city. So think about that one. Okay. And one other quick thing, again, I'll refer to uh, seismic risk assessment of the critical resources in the city, water filtration plant, El Estero, and the collection and distribution system. It's good to point out that the Cater filtration plant also treats water for the whole south coast except for the Goleta district. Thank you very much. Thank you. Rick Goodfriend will be the last speaker. Good friend. Madam Mayor. Hi. City Council members. I really need your support. We need your support on Bass Street. I've sent some emails to you. I don't know if you've seen them. Uh, also a video and the video doesn't show anything what's happening there with the speed at night people are going 60 miles an hour down that road wow. uh, and it's a one lane road and I've sent letters to and calls to city you know workers here uh, the administration and there's no not even any uh, speed signs after Mitchell Trena on Bass Street there's one and there's supposed to be two even a policeman told me that there's supposed to be another sign, and they even know that it's missing. And I also talked to uh, uh, Dawn Hingle, and she said she's going to put these signs up, and nothing's happened. Uh, this was in, I think, July or, or June. And then uh, also talked to her about putting up some signs, speed signs, on uh, 
you know, I'm just so happy that you guys are listening to me like this. This, this is a wonderful feeling being here. I never thought it would be like this, so I just <laughs> want to throw that in there. Um, after Arriaga on Bath Street, people are coming off the freeway and then turning on Bath. There's nothing there. So people are used to being on the freeway, and then they're going down Bath Street again, not 30 miles an hour, not 40, 15, 60. There's been so many close calls. I don't know how many accidents there's been, but somebody's going to get killed. I mean, nobody's gotten killed yet, as I know, but there's been so many near misses. It's going to happen. And I just don't want to come here and say, you know what? Last week, somebody got killed. So this is something that we all can work on. And, you know, people say, Rick, you got to go get petitions. You got to do this and that. Everybody knows this is a problem and a big safety issue. Uh, the other thing I would propose is putting some stop signs. You know, it's like a freeway there. There's no stop signs for a half mile. Garden Street, everywhere on the east side has all these traffic controls. Santa Barbara, Bath Street has nothing. Castile Street also is a one lane. Same problem. Uh, so I'm happy to say I almost got stopped by a motorcycle policeman today on De La Vina. They're out there watching right now. So I uh, had calls to the... Uh, to Rich Gloss, and he's going to be helping too. But I think we all need to come together with the department, the, part, the transportation uh, people, and police. So there's a lot more I could say, but I'm going to leave have, it. So. Have you already met with Drew Van Hengel? Uh, I've talked to her. Okay. And uh, I've been working with Hillary uh, Allen, mm -hmm. okay. and she's frustrated working with her. She's going over her head okay. because okay. nothing's well, been we'll done. Okay, we'll see. Okay. Okay. Thank and you so you much. Hit, yeah, you sent me an email right before Fiesta, yeah. and I'm sorry I didn't get back to you, but I will. Um, That's fine. It's a common common issue, and sometimes it's the speed on Ontario, and then the speed goes away on Ontario, and it comes up in Garden, and then it comes up on, and whatever it is. That's why we have those slow Santa Barbara well, I've signs, got one up there. and I'm sure yeah. you do because I've seen them on there. So, so we'll we'll work with you and try to figure it out. And I'm other, sorry. The one thing I want to say is that. I've talked to the police, yeah. about eight of them, and they all say, you know, we want to do it, but we're understaffed. Yeah, well, they, got, they give lots of citations, too, but, but we, that's not going to be the whole answer. So, okay. Yeah. Well, thank okay. you for your support. No, we'll be talking to you and trying to figure it out. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Um, okay, I have no more. I'll go ahead with, oh, I knew there was something special. <laughs> fire chief, come on up. We want to hear what's going on with the Zaka fire. Good Thank you, Mayor Bloom, members of council, Ron Prince, fire chief. I just wanted to give you a, a brief uh, update. Uh, I know a lot of you have been at the uh, county EOC, a lot of you have been at the briefings, but I thought it would be helpful to bring you up to date as of about two hours ago, what's going on with this, this huge fire, and um, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, what I'd like to do is, is just cover briefly some of the stats, uh, some of the current situation status, cover a little bit about the fire management teams that are working on this, in addition talk about the effort that's going on in the front country in terms of pre-planning. Uh, I'd like to also mention the, some of the public information outlets that are going on and spreading the word about this fire. So uh, just to, to start off with, I'd like to let everybody know that it is a little over 70,000 acres so far. Uh, they, as of this morning, they were thinking it was 68% contained. And they're holding true, the Forest Service is holding true to the September 7th uh, containment date. And I think that's largely due to the, the weather that's been cooperating in the last few days. Uh, the evacuation orders are still in place for Paradise Road, Lower San Inez River Road to Gibraltar Dam. And uh, there are some, uh, I believe the, uh, the Peachtree community is still under that evacuation order as well. There's almost 2,400 uh, firefighters on the line here. And this, this is a, a day-old map that's up on the screen, but it's, uh, it shows to a large measure what's been happening uh, since July 4th. And uh, this, this fire, luckily, the last four days has been actually been pushed to the north. And uh, we had an extreme event, as you all know, Friday, and, and some heavy winds uh, that finally died down on Saturday. But then the last several days, the pattern has helped, and it's really stopped the southward advancement of this fire, and it's been pushing to the, uh, the north. Um, but this event, this wind is supposed to die out this evening, and uh, we'll have some light sundowners, maybe 15 miles an hour, nothing significant tonight. 
but then we'll go back to a northern, I've been told, the normal weather pattern starting Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Uh, of course, this, this weather information changes every single day, but right now, uh, the normal weather pattern would suggest that the fire would continue to start to crawl back east and southeast. So uh, we're definitely not out of the woods, and uh, what I'd like to tell you now is what's, what's been going on uh, with respect to some of the activity on the fire line. There have been some what's called burnout operations, and the, the Forest Service has been taking advantage of this wind. They've gone down to some dozer lines that they created several weeks ago, and they're trying to burn from those dozer lines back up into the, the fire itself to create a, a larger buffer. So if the fire turns directions, we've got just that much more of a buffer of an area that's been burnt out. So today is a big day in the, in the history of this fire for us because if they're successful with their burnout operations, we'll get uh, probably 2,000 acres more of a buffer. Uh, but it's been so wet and humid, it's interesting that they've had a hard time yesterday and today actually getting this back, uh, backfire burnout operation to work successfully. So you will see some more smoke uh, later this afternoon. But uh, in any case, we've got plenty of resources on this fire, uh, not the least of which is uh, the access to a DC-10, which has been doing some practice runs, and they've been checking out the, uh, the ridge line, the Communist Yellow line, to target exactly where would be the most appropriate spot to lay literally miles of retardant if it became necessary. Uh, so it's great to just to have that, that kind of resource, because that can do what our hand crews cannot do, which is to do a quick uh, replacement of a, and make a fire break within a matter of, of minutes. So that's, uh, that's good news to have that access through CAL FIRE for that resource. But the, as far as fire management goes, uh, the fire has been broken into two large zones. It's gotten so large that the Forest Service has broken it into a north and a south zone. Uh, the base camp there at uh, um, a Live Oak will stay as the south zone incident command post, and then they'll be at, uh, I believe it's uh, Richardson, yeah, Richardson, yeah, Richardson Camp, I, camp, I believe. Yeah. There in Kwayuma is, uh, the, is the north zone uh, for, and they have an incident command team up there. They've also got a, a third uh, team that's being uh, put together right here on the, for, specifically for the front country, and that's uh, CAL FIRES leading that. And there's 300 firefighters at Earl Warren right now, um, and they're camped there. They're, getting, they're actually going out in the community right now. In the city limits alone, we've got four strike teams, which is about, uh, uh, that's what, 20 engine companies. Uh, between 192 and the front country in the city limits, checking out road access ways, talking to residents, just getting familiar with what the evacuation routes would be. Um, so they're, they're getting prepared for worst case scenario, which is if this fire literally does a, a 180 in the next few days to a week. Um, again, we're, the weather has really been cooperative, uh, but I, because of the potential for winds changing directions, uh, we're not out of the woods, and I'm really appreciative of having that kind of resource, uh, the access to those types of resources. Um, one of the things that uh, we'll be doing tomorrow is we're having a meeting with our police department and public works folks to talk about their role in an evacuation and uh, how we can – we have these trigger points that are set up. And right now it's all based on the wind, but right now a trigger point would be for a evacuation warning for the residents in the front, our front country would be if the fire got within a mile of the riverbed, uh, north of the riverbed. The evacuation order would take place if the fire got actually reached the north edge of the San Inez River bed. So, um, and again, it's, it could be, those are just trigger points that are part of a planning process. If the wind's blowing really strong, we'll, we'll be issuing those evacuation orders uh, sooner than later. And it is interesting and ironic that uh, we've had the evacuation drill just a few months ago, and a lot of the residents up there are, have a sense of what it means to be ready to evacuate. But I'm hoping through all the, the great job that the media has done over the last few days that uh, the rest of the residents up in the front country are, are learning and thinking about that same thing, getting their, their head in the game in terms of what it really means to evacuate and be ready to move quickly. And it's a, it's a painful thought process to go through, but it's incredibly helpful. and. Uh, one council member knows exactly what uh, that felt like about, uh, it was almost 20 years ago, or over 20 years ago. <laughs> uh, council member Horton was in Sycamore Canyon. So um, we're hoping to avoid that kind of uh, situation, but uh, again, we, we've got incredible cooperation from the county, from the Forest Service, from the state. Um, and it's uh, been really gratifying to work and see the activity in the, the county emergency operating center. We've been 
waiting and waiting and waiting and watching every day to see if we should open up our EOC, and luckily, so far, we haven't got into that position. We're ready to open up our EOC within 45 minutes, though, should the decision be made. Uh, let's see. With our, as you know, as far as public information goes, there's kiosks set up here at City Hall and at the Mission. There's six more kiosks got opened up today all around the South Coast, trying to let people know what the current status is on a every 24-hour update. There have been briefings going on at about five different levels all day long, every day, uh, with fire folks, with the county EOC folks. Uh, uh, PAOs have been meeting, and uh, it's been a really incredible effort. And I, I suppose uh, the last thing I'd just like to leave you with is, is a legitimate and final word of caution, and that is that you know, it wouldn't take more than a couple days of bad weather to have us be back right in the situation we were last Friday where it uh, – it looked incredibly scary, and rightly so. Obviously, we had a lot of uh, ash and smoke in the city, and uh, we're hoping to avoid that situation. So it's, it's a almost hour-by-hour hour situation right now. We have a little bit of breather, but uh, we are definitely keeping vigilant, and we'll keep you informed if anything changes uh, in any significant way. Yeah, I've been really impressed by the uh, – everybody's working together so well. State, even federal officials are out there, and the county, and the cities, and all the jurisdictions. It's been really wonderful. Um, the radio stations that we, we have angst about <laughs> um, in the past seem to have stepped up to the plate in a beautiful way. I, Absolutely. Been, uh, okay. I, I thought that was true, and it's really yeah. been good. All the media has done a super job. It's yeah, really and the TV stations, too. And you can uh, Google, you know, like KEYT, and you can get the latest on there. So all of that is just wonderful for people. Yeah, they've done a really great job. Yeah. And can I ask the 211 that we've told people to call, has that been – do we update that, or is that not yet going well, for the no, South County? It has been going, uh, and I can't tell you the last day it got updated. We, we tried to hook them up with InsaWeb, which is the latest information oh, that everybody's been accessing. But yeah. to, I haven't looked at it this morning. I actually called a couple times just to test it to see if it was actually working as well as I thought it, and I've right. been telling everybody. And actually, it, it was incredible. There was the person there at, uh, that answered the phone actually read off the website, gave me the latest information, the latest evacuation orders. Yeah. I haven't called it today, and I haven't looked okay. at the website today, but I, it's my understanding they are keeping it current. Well, and InsaWeb is a good choice, too, for people. I-N-C-I-W-E-B. It shows a neat map, and, and you know, f people like me who need information, it's really good. That is one of the best sources of information. Yeah, and then, of course, channels 18, 19, and 20, too, are all on a scroll, and it's really good. So, great. Okay, uh, Ms. Falcone? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, yeah, I, I know that... Uh, the mayor and I were at the briefing in the press conference on Saturday. I was there at the 11 o'clock this morning. And um, yesterday, Helene and I were on a conference call with the governor's office. Uh, just really, it, it was, there were so many folks on that conference call. It was extraordinary. There was Feinstein's office, Lois Capps's office as so the federal government, both of our state legislators, representatives from the city and the county fire, the sheriff, our police. Uh, U.S. Forestry, uh, California Division of Forestry. I mean, the, the, the resources that are being brought to bear uh, on this on this uh, wildland fire is is really quite extraordinary. Um, the teams that are out at War or Earl Warren, where I went just about at one o'clock, just before this meeting, to just say hi to the folks who are here from all over the state. Uh, what they're doing, as you mentioned, is the uh, city has, well, the south coast has been sectioned off into uh, quadrants, if you want to call them that, and these teams that are here from all over the state are basically taking an area, a neighborhood, they're learning the ins and outs, the neighborhood, mm -hmm. the streets, so that they can go in and they can get people. And so folks need to know that there are a tremendous number of folks working on it, but there is one plan. There is one right. unified, coordinated plan that everybody has bought into, that everybody knows about, that everybody's participating in. So it's not like you're going to have right hand, left hand, not knowing what's going on. Right. Everybody is at the one table with the one plan. And I think people can take a lot of comfort in that and to know that they're not alone, that it's not going to be scattershot 
heaven forbid this thing does happen. But I really want to impress upon folks that although that's in place, and it's in place right now, whether it gets triggered or not depends on a whole variety of different, right. different things. But people need to be prepared themselves because there are power lines on the back side of, of the mountain that could affect our power if they are compromised. And so you need to be prepared with all of your stuff that you need if the power goes out. If an evacuation happens, you need to have a list of what you would take and where you would go and where you would meet your family. So there are a couple of affirmative things that people can really do to plan for some contingencies now, hopefully, at the end of the day, this will all have been a really elaborate drill. But the fire back there is real. It could shift with the wind. We're sort of at Mother Nature's mercy. But we're doing everything in our coordinated power to really make sure that if certain things happen, we have plans in place. And people need to take those steps to make themselves as prepared as possible. But at the end of the day, you won't be alone. So understand that too. I'm really incredibly proud of, of everybody. Watching this work has been really a, a, an amazing learning experience and to be part of it. I mean, I'm so proud with everybody's professionalism and dedication and people don't sleep. It's amazing. Um, so we're in, good, we're in good hands considering the circumstances. Okay, Mr. Horton. Um, Ron, I I saw some video on the DC-10, which was really impressive, and I'm just wondering if you could say uh, when that would be used and, um, and what the limitations, if any, might be. Uh, I guess it can't fly at night, and I don't know if they can fly in a – I'm thinking if it comes this way, there's going to be heavy winds, and I don't know what the situation is or how low they can fly. What would be the usage of that uh, tool? Well, uh, Chief Prince. Yeah, Mayor, Mayor Bloom, uh, Council Member Horton. Um, I'm not – we have a pilot in our midst who could probably get technical <laughs> with uh, what its limitations are with respect to wind, but the, uh, the, the DC-10 will deliver about 26,000 gallons of fire retardant, and it's – that's about a three-mile swath wow. at once. And it, it, uh, it's a very powerful aircraft, but as you probably saw, or maybe not, that just as recently as a few months ago, it, it dropped a load of fire retardant and actually landed in the tops of some trees and barely, uh, narrowly escaped. So I think the pilots are going to be conservative, but that's why they've been flying this area for the last several days, to get real comfortable with the thermal currents, with the terrain. And the best application, absolutely, for that uh, aircraft is the ridge top, the Camino Cielo. That's perfectly set up, a straight shot for laying a long uh, fire line. It's uh, and perhaps the city administrator can talk about the effects of the wind on an aircraft that size. But uh, I'm, I'm confident that uh, unless it's the absolute most extreme sundowners, I think it would be very effective uh, laying a fire retardant. And actually, it's about an hour turnaround time for Victorville, where it's stationed. So we could probably lay close to 10 miles of fire line in three hours. And that would be a pre-treatment pre of the fuels in advance of the fire actually getting there. How long would that, how long would that last then? Well, it's it's actually like a wet uh, concrete material. It it lasts for days. Wow, very interesting. That's besides the helicopters and the other planes that you already have working. What is it? Eight helicopters or something like that? Actually, eight yeah. Planes to, or whatever. To be exact, it's okay. I believe it's uh, I've got it here. It's you've got a lot of uh, fixed wing. You've actually got uh, 16 helicopters, oh, wow. eight air tankers, and two uh, air attack, which is okay. like the incident command uh, platform up in the air. And I had heard this is the largest fire. I think this was at yesterday's briefing, the largest fire in California history, bigger than the if, day if fire. If it's not, it's going to be soon. It is going to be, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can I add something just on that yeah, one point the, the DC-10? Sure. Um, this morning at the briefing, the gentleman from the uh, – uh, California Division of Forestry, I believe, uh, he said that another application for the DC-10, which has been cleared to uh, to um, be used in in federal on federal lands, which usually is not the case. The feds won't let you do it, so we had to get a waiver for it. But another application, not just the preventative and trying to help with the power lines in Camino Cielo, but they're looking at whether or not they can actually um, use it on the uh, fire line itself, and, and, and edge, how right. is how is that going? Because well, they're trying to that finger that you saw at the southern right. edge. They're thinking maybe they can lie some lay some retardant down in there. 
I just Is got off the, the phone with uh, folks from the uh, Forest Service, a liaison officer, and that was something that they were still debating uh, if they were going to actually do a run today to try to either hit the front edge of the fire or maybe just a, a few yards off of that. And again, their terrain is so uh, extreme back there. They, they need to pick an opportunity where they can be the most effective. And when the hills are going up and down like this, it's, they'll end up being some gaps. So they have to pick the right spot. But they, I, as recently as about two hours ago, they were, the debate was going on whether they're going to do some runs. They actually did use it on the fire a couple days ago uh, in some practice runs. And uh, it is, it's impressive to watch. Yeah. But they have to be real careful, though. Okay. Ms. Schneider? Thank you. I think they did use the DC-10 in the day fire last year, which yes, they was did. a big significant issue of how that fire went out. So I look forward to, to seeing it here. Um, I, I also just want to you know, thank everyone involved and, and don't want to repeat everything that's been said, but, but add my ditto to it. Um, and just how incredibly coordinated everything is. Uh, and also our own non-fire department staff who are part of this, uh, Nina Johnson, uh, Betty Weiss, and John Ledbetter, who have been giving us brief go to the briefings. Um, the, the people are ready to go if, if we ever needed to open our EOC, uh, and everyone has their role, which is really important and, and right on target. Um, the, the other piece I've noticed, certainly expanding, the media has been really helpful uh, for people who need to get information. I'm noticing our own city website right on the home page, so santabarbaraca.gov. You can click on to a number of different sources. You can go to the county um, website. We, we uh, I think all of us received an email from someone concerned that since there was a Montecito um, community meeting last night, that something different's happening. And, and first, my understanding is no, that's not the case. It just happened to be a community meeting. And uh, frankly, I would think we would want everyone's time and energy spent on the plan and, and monitoring the fire and go to the website for updated information. Um, um, are and are there any other besides INSA Web and our city website, the county website, the that people could go to if they wanted? Channel 20's Channel 20 has been well, repeating 18, 18, a lot 18, of 20. the N18's been repeating a lot mm -hmm. of the press conferences. Yeah, that's but. that's correct. They're repeating the uh, press conferences and the the information is so dynamic, uh, uh, Councilmember Schneider. It's it's it is good to go to those websites and the TV and the media has just been incredible. They've been yeah. updating their information on a real regular basis. So those are some of the best sources. Uh, of course, the city's website has been updated daily. And Nina, I agree, Nina and John and Betty, th during the weekend they've all done a, just a, a great job, and, and we continue to have a, a presence there. Um, it'll it'll probably pick up again in a couple of days. We'll need to go back. And they're actually talking about moving uh, the EOC and some of the operations over to the uh, UCSB campus. Um, and they're doing a lot of contingency planning. But this has been an incredible opportunity for us and the county to exercise all these plans and to, to look at the, the staffing, look at the roles people play. And it's a, it, I wouldn't call it a drill, but it certainly has been a great opportunity to make sure that our systems are in place. Right. And uh, I think you know we can tell the community that we are doing everything possible, not only with our cooperators and our partners in this, but uh, uh, internal city staff is yeah. really doing a great job. So I, I'm impressed as well. Yeah. Well, thank you. And, and I just, I guess one other piece, this this conversation we just have is now streaming live on our city website and will be there in the archives and people can click on if they wanted to hear this again. Um, and, I, and I know there are other uh, media outlets and so I guess we should get you back to work and, <laughs> and uh, th unless there are other questions. And, but uh, thank you very much. Okay, Mr. House has something in then. Yeah, just um, a couple more things. Um, please, uh, how, are, how are our firefighters doing from our yeah. particular force? Well, they got they got a lot going. Yeah, they they do. Uh, our firefighters have got about uh, 24 active, not only on this incident, but to some actually in Idaho, so part of an overhead team. But uh, of the 2,400 or so firefighters, they do a, a two-week stint where they're working 12-hour shifts and they take 12 hours off, and then after two weeks they're let off for two days, and then they can be reassigned. I think uh, you could tell if, if you looked at some of the. Uh, uh, conferences, press conferences and whatnot this last weekend, that some are getting very tired and uh, it's great that they've got a chance to spell themselves this last few days and take a little uh, respite. But uh, no, they're, this is what it's all about though. These folks, they have an adrenaline uh, rush that will go on for weeks and uh, they're really doing a great job. But they, they definitely needed a little bit of a rest and this last, this break in the weather has been fantastic. Yeah. Uh, just two, two more quick things. One, um, uh, with all this focus on the fire on the other side of the hill, 
I want to commend you for the quick response and the success of knocking down that uh, house fire oh, yeah. in Riviera. And some of us don't live too far from there. And it's the second time we've had, a, in the past a couple of years, a major um, a conflagration right there uh, that could very well have gotten out of hand. And um, uh, kudos to everyone who was involved in how quickly and professionally that was taken care of. I'll pass that on. And um, then lastly, there, we've got a lot of folks um, who are here helping us out from out of the area because of this, uh, this agreement to, to share these resources. Is there anything that the community can do or would be appropriate for us to do to uh, show our appreciation or to be able to offer them any, you know, lemonade or something? <laughs> but, I mean, more, more, more substantial than that, I mean, anything, because these, these folks are here to really help us out, and we really do appreciate it. And um, at least a, a, the kind word could certainly be extended, but maybe there's something else we can do. Well, historically, with an incident of this size, uh, and what's really appreciated is when the incident's all over, uh, a proclamation from the council to the, the various agencies that assisted is something that, believe it or not, will get sent to a main agency and get copied and goes to all the fire stations, and it's something that's uh, sort of a, a badge of honor. And I think that certainly is a, I don't, it may seem symbolic, but it's really appreciated by all the jurisdictions that participate as far as helping the logistical uh, and uh, care and feeding of these folks Trust me, they're being uh, fed very well, and uh, but they they do know that we appreciate them. But I think uh, in the aftermath, uh, an official proclamation would be really appreciated. Okay, by well, midstream, thank you very much. Goes right back to them. Thank you very much for your work. That's yeah. great. That's easy to do, and we'll do it right after. And hope it's tomorrow. Hope it gets put out tomorrow. Huh? Okay. Thank you very. I know it's not tomorrow, but thank you very much for coming in. And you're so busy. Okay. Now we'll go to the consent calendar. Uh, you have a couple things to read by title only. Item 4, adoption of ordinance to extend time period for redevelopment agency eminent domain, recommending that council adopt by reading of title only an ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Barbara amending ordinance numbers 3566, 3923, 4438, 4894, 5098, 5089, 5314, 5363, and 5388 and approving and adopting the proposed amendment to the redevelopment plan for the Central City Redevelopment Project. And item 7, adoption of ordinance for Federal Aviation Administration Agreement, recommending that Council adopt by reading of title only, an ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Barbara approving a memorandum of agreement dated August 7, 2007, between the City of Santa Barbara and the U.S. Department of Transportation Federal Aviation Administration, for all navigation equipment at the Santa Barbara Municipal Airport. Okay, that's reading by title only without objection. We'll wait for the reading. We have a member of the public that would like to speak on item number five. Go ahead and read the title of that. Mr. Locke. Art from Scrap Contract for Youth Watershed Education Programs. Okay. My name is Kenneth Locke. Um, I think I spoke um, in relation to the art from scrap in the past. Um, this is a educational program, a watershed. Uh, I don't know if it has anything to do with art. Um, I don't think so. But the, uh, as I mentioned, uh, I think back in a past public comment, I uh, brought up the concept of uh, recycling art. Um, the, the basis of recycling art in relation to education and the children is actually we understand uh, the work of uh, Jackson Pollock. Um, Jackson Pollock provides the means for us to understand art, to how it is currently understood uh, in relation to it being an exercise, allows the kids to actually have a physical, metaphysical relationship with the creation, again, of art that we can refer to as a spiritual. Uh, there's been writing. Um, the, um, and then once the, uh, they they participate in that painting and uh, create an object. Uh, the, the object is actually a secondary, um, it's secondary. Um, primarily is, is that the children have the, uh, uh, the opportunity to exercise that, uh, again, physical, metaphysical, in relation to the contribution that Jackson Pollock has made to the art community, in relation to the, I explain, in relation to the avant-garde, in relation, to, again, to the 20th century abstract. Um, from the perspective of art from scrap, is they're, they don't, they're not functioning at that level of intelligence. It, do, it doesn't go there type of thing. I think I mentioned before we should have uh, art, uh, uh, from, uh, say, science from scrap, 
we should introduce the children so they could take some of the, the, the scrap and then apply it to science as well as and integrate the children in relation to being an artist and scientist both. That's uh, where the higher level of intelligence is. Thank you. Thank you. Move consent. Second. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. On to Finance Committee, Mr. Horton. We uh, met today at 1 o'clock to discuss uh, workers' comp and other insurance policies uh, for the city, and I'm pleased to report the uh, Finance Committee heard some great information that our rates are going to be reduced substantially, and part of that uh, deals with the way the city addresses uh, workers' comp cases. So we're That's very right. pleased to report that. That's right. Good. Thank you. Item number 11, please. Infrastructure Financing Task Force. Okay. Mr. Armstrong. Yes, Madam Mayor, members of the Council. As you recall, last spring when we presented the uh, six-year capital improvement plan, um, we had changed the format dramatically, and we had also um, uh, changed the plan to start identifying unfunded projects. Uh, to refresh your memory, the total six-year plan uh, that we uh, presented to the Council included $441 million of uh, capital pro projects for the next six years. And before I talk about the unfunded projects, I want to talk a little about what's funded because I think it's important to remember that uh, we do have a lot of projects that we are funding in the next six years. Uh, those include, of course, the uh, airfield safety project, which is underway, and the terminal expansion project, which, where we have identified all the funding. Uh, in light of the recent bridge catastrophe in uh, Minneapolis, I uh, wanted to mention that we have $30 million of bridge um, replacements scheduled over the next six years, all of which we have already identified the funding. That includes not only the Cabrillo Bridge over Mission Creek, I think most of you are aware of, which is nearly $20 million, but the Haley de la Vina Bridge over Mission Creek, which is another $10 million that's scheduled to be done. Uh, we've also scheduled uh, over $25 million of improvements to the catered treatment plant, and that's on top of the uh, $20 million of improvements we've just completed there. Uh, we've scheduled over $20 million to the to El Estero and our sewer system, and that's on top of almost $20 million of improvements we've just completed at El Estero. Um, and we've also got $10 million of improvements at the harbor scheduled um, for the next uh, six years. Um, however, we do have um, a significant gap of projects that are not funded. Uh, we identified in the report about $146 million, and as I've said several times, I, I think that number is probably on the low side because in many cases the departments haven't identified some projects because they just felt the funding wasn't forthcoming. The major area where we have a funding deficiency is in uh, those projects that are related to the general fund for departments that uh, don't have any outside funding sources. And the, the biggest, of course, um, are the police department and police headquarters, uh, what we're calling now phase two of the fire headquarters project. Uh, there's a number of parks and recreation projects, both uh, facility enhancements as well as rehabilitation in, in parks and recreation facilities. And then although we have a pretty good funding source with Measure D and the utility tax, we still have uh, a number of projects in the transportation area that, that will need to be addressed. Um, I think it's important to note that this is not a unique problem to Santa Barbara. In fact, as I look at our, the current state of our infrastructure, it's probably in better condition than most cities in California. Uh, but now is the time to start dealing with the issue before it gets worse. Uh, generally in the United States and in California over the last, really in the last 20 years, funding for infrastructure has declined uh, as a result of a number of reasons. Uh, uh, the federal government uh, discontinued revenue sharing uh, which used to be a pretty reliable source of funding for, for capital improvements. Uh, the state, uh, because of their budget problems, has cut back and, of course, for many years was had reduced funding to cities. Uh, and then just um, and then gas tax has not been increased significantly. And, of course, the price of gas, uh, the price of asphalt is directly related to the price of gasoline. And if you have a fixed percent gas tax, it doesn't track inflation. And so gas tax receipts that we've received from the states have been, in inflation terms have been in decline for, some, for many years. Um, we have uh, went to the Finance Committee a couple of weeks ago and are recommending um, that the council establish uh, what we're calling the Infrastructure Financing Task Force. Uh, we're recommending that it be composed of seven individuals, um, and among their duties would be to 
uh, not only just look at the capital issues, but look at our overall budgeting techniques, how we plan for capital improvements, um, look at uh, alternative financing strategies, uh, invite folks in from other agencies that have identified these kinds of issues, um, and help to recommend to the City Council uh, a variety of action ste steps that can be taken to start addressing the problem. Um, the types of people that we think you would want or we would want to have on this committee would be folks that have some experience in municipal finance and capital planning, uh, capital markets and long-term long debt financing, uh, environmental issues because clearly when we make capital improvement or do a capital improvements it has an impact on the environment public outreach and participation because uh, whether we like it or not at some point this is going to cost the public more money and we need to deal with that issue honestly and up front. Uh, when we talk with the Finance Committee about the appropriate way to select the members of this task force we had a, a lively discussion. Uh, we think that some of the people that we would want to get on this committee um, are the types of people that we, we're going to have to go out and solicit them for the committee and ask them to be on it uh, and so the the, the recommended approach uh, that, that the Finance Committee and um, I am recommending to the full council is that, that you allow uh, Councilmember Horton as chair of the Finance Committee and myself to do a solicitation process. We would do our normal public solicitation process, but then we would interview candidates. We would actually go out and also solicit people to serve on the committee and then recommend to the Finance Committee and then the full council uh, a slate of seven members for the committee. Uh, we think that process would, would work and allow us to really go out and do some outreach. We think that this process, once the committee is established, would take uh, six to nine months. Uh, I will be assigning staff from our office and we'll also have staff from the Finance Department um, and Public Works to staff the committee and help them in their deliberations and, and bring information to them. Um, so that's what we're proposing. Uh, uh, again, this is, uh, in my opinion, it's a long-term um, this is not a quick fix. Uh, it's taken 20 to 30 years to get where we are, and it's going to take a long time to get out of it. But um, I think good cities and well-managed cities address these issues and start dealing with them before it becomes a crisis, and now is a good time to start dealing with it. Yeah. I think sometimes we vote for these big bond issues, which we do for infrastructure, and we think that's that'll take care of it all. But, but they're so expensive to do even one project that – that big bond measure just doesn't quite cover it all. Yeah, and I, I think in some ways people voted for the state bond issue and thought, well, okay, now we've solved the problem, and it's just the tip of the iceberg that's statewide right. and, and even in our, in our city. That's right. Well, that's an innovative way. I presume that you will take us, uh, any ideas that we have, too? Sure. <laughs> okay. In fact, I, I think I, we've already received some. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not surprised. We have some ideas here. We have opinions. That's how we get elected. Um, Mr. House. I'm not going to offer much in terms of uh, opinions or anything like that except one, and that is I really appreciate your taking this on this way. Um, we've talked about this since um, um, I came on council. You've been working on it since way before others on council have been concerned about it and shown interest in this. Um, we've taken our um, budget issues um, and internal structure um, very seriously in taking this in a step-by-step in a -step fashion, knowing that this is, uh, this is something that we need to do. Um, our... Um, um, a capital program addresses the needs in their priority, uh, and it's a it's a, a robust, strong, sturdy uh, program to, that's been to delivering results directly to the benefit of the public. And so, I think there um, any misunderstanding about our doing this um, needs to be addressed straight up. And this is proactive. This is something that is built up over a long period of time in the communities that don't take a moment to address it and take maybe uh, set up a structure like this are just going to be in, in, in real trouble. And uh, we're not one of those. And so, um, uh, Mr. Armstrong, under your guidance, I very much appreciate this, uh, this approach, and I think that you're on the right track. <laughs> and I do appreciate the Finance Committee and Mr. Horton and your idea of um, reaching out into the community and not just um, hoping that, you know, the, the magical right team sort of shows up, but just really beat the bushes and see who is out there that can bring that kind of expertise that we need. And uh, that's all. I just want to thank you very much for this. Okay. Ms. Schneider. 
Thank you. It was a lively discussion, good discussion at Finance Committee, and I think, uh, assuming we all approve this, Mr. Horton and Mr. Armstrong is going to be very busy for the next few weeks in, in, in talking with people. Um, we mentioned the, the state bonds, uh, and you know, you pass that and you think everything's done. How important it is to have local control over the dollars, yeah. because not only with the state bonds, as we know, uh, it's good to have, but it's such a competitive process, and th there are lots of need all over the state. Um, I think that emphasizes what Mr. Armstrong's saying, how we're not unique in, in the needs to upgrade our infrastructure because of the competition that we're seeing for those dollars on a statewide level. So to have um, a group of experts locally here, both in terms of capital planning, on finance, on um, pu and also public outreach and, and getting the voters, because they're going to have to approve any kind of, you know, not any kind, but many different options that would require voter approval, uh, getting that public outreach there and uh, knowing what the environmental impacts are and so forth is very important. Um, just thinking the two PINs, uh, the staff that we had for uh, PINs talking about, you know, our basic public health and safety and also our infrastructure, and we need the employees to do that, but if they don't have the equipment and if we don't have the, the, the stuff in place, then uh, there's not so much we can do individually So, or as a, as a group of employees. Um, so I'm really looking forward to this. It's a great proactive step. I appreciate uh, Mr. Armstrong's leadership in, in this process. And um, I have some names, of course. We'll, we'll forward mm -hmm. it on and see what, what comes out of it. But thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Ms. Falcone. Thank you. A couple of things. You know, it's, it's to, to follow up on, on the issue of the state is that the state will also, although we pass these things statewide, the state legislature will also eke it out on their own timetable. And they will also um, take or <laughs> commandeer some of that money. So not all of the money that people pass in these various statewide bonds even get to the local level. It's, it really is sort of parsed out and eked out. And one of the classic examples of that is currently in the uh, 1B money that we just passed for transportation. We were supposed to get $2 billion uh, for cities and counties right at the start of the whole thing, and the legislature decided to, oh, well, we're only going to give them one billion, and then they've set conditions and so forth. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff that we have to do on the ground that, although we have these things that we passed, doesn't mean we're necessarily getting the funding to do them all, especially all at the same time. That's just never going to happen. The other thing is, as you said, it's this, this has been incremental, and I don't want people to think that we have structures out there that are used for park and recreation or um, facilities that are rented or so forth that are about to fall down. I mean, nothing is in such a state of disrepair that it, we would never let it get that far. So these are, are a list of, of um, capital improvements that are really on a on a prioritized schedule to some degree already because we never really let things go to complete deterioration. Now as far as the wastewater and the water is concerned we had to comply with unfunded state mandates basically because there's clean water and there's sewage water um, improvements in terms of cleanliness and so forth which is all good but the regulations come down without the dollars attached, so that's why we have to foot the bill for a $20 million bond here, a $20 million bond there, da 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 da, -da. So I'm very uh, pleased that the city's engaging in this proactive, very uh, affirmative look-see at exactly what it is we have and exactly what it is these facilities need, and then how do we go about funding them in the best uh, least expensive way, although everything costs a great deal of money. We have nothing that is in such a state of disrepair that anything is going to fall down. I mean, that's just, people need to know that and understand that. So um, I'm happy to help in any way, but I have full confidence in Mr. Horton, Mr. Armstrong, to uh, go out there and get a, a really swell group of committed folks to help us out. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Horton. Okay, Mr. Horton. Well, I'm looking forward to receiving the recommendations from all of you folks and mm -hmm. others in the community as well. And having said that, I'd like to move recommendations A and B of the staff report. Second.
Okay. Mr. Barnwell, did you have something you wanted to add? Just a question. Sure. Uh, where's Max Flashman when you need him, huh? <laughs> no, really. Uh, <laughs> Good question. I have a question about the facilities that we don't have yeah. that we think we might want to have. And I have been a proponent for quite a while, specifically now Parks and Rec, of a master plan for our parks. Um, we Not only do we have older buildings in them, but we have older layouts and placement of those buildings within the parcels. So I asked the question, or I proposed the question to the gang of seven who's going to put this thing together, um, can we look at that? Can we talk about what would an updated um, McKinsey Park, Pershing Park, um, you know, name it, the La Mesa Park, for example, uh, maybe an underutilized, underused park. But I, I, I can't stress enough my own personal f uh, feelings that our, our parks are um, designed, not only built out in need of repair, but designed from the 30s and the 40s. And I think we, we need to look at what we can do to bring them up to date. Um, I think of the tennis courts along the Highway 101. At one time, packed with people, frequently used, and, and a little bit of a... Uh, caveat to Ms. Falcone, there are some things over there that can't be used anymore. They're near falling down. The bathroom over there, for example. But then the rise of other sports that have kind of displaced some of the focus of the old-timey sports. Skateboarding is a good one. Um, so when we look at repairing what we have, I think we should also talk about um, what it is we also want to add to that, that parks infrastructure. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion. Madam Mayor, oh, so yes, that's that sorry, just Mr. Raised, House. Uh, if I may. Sure. Um, you mentioned Max Fleshman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but it's just actually, I was looking at the list of things here that are going to be discussed. And uh, let's just say if there were a billionaire or so that wanted to contribute to the effort, wanted to participate somehow in Parks and Rec, mm -hmm. saw some opportunity, saw something, you know, maybe instead of being kind of complaining about this isn't right and that's not right, maybe they wanted to, like, chip in and participate, maybe own some of that or participate with that. And is this going to address that at all? Would there be, that would that maybe be an opportunity that we would talk about public participation in, in that? Because in a way, in the city of Santa Barbara, a lot of the things that we hold near and dear you know, really came from a very generous philanthropic right. uh, community. It's a Peabody Stadium. I know, I know it may be small check. compared to the large issue, but can that be part of the, one of the Let me on the list? Sure. I'll address both the comments first. My dream would be, quite honestly, that we would have master plans for all of our major capital components. Um, in water and wastewater now, we have 10-year master plans, and we update them every five years. But we really need that for the drainage system. We need it for the transportation system. We need it for the parks facilities. We need it for our public facilities. And then once you have those plans, then you start looking for funding sources, including private philanthropy, because, as you said, in our history, that's been a huge source of, of funding. I think um, in the parks and recreation area, I think because they've We've been putting out fires and really just maintaining facilities uh, and not a lot of enhancements. We haven't gone to that next step. I think, you know, in the discussions with the National Guard Army, though, is a good example where we have, we have said, hey, let's, let's look for private funding there, make that a community effort to, to do that. And I think that's a logical expectation out of this process is that we, one, we, we start having a dream list and we also have a master plan of where we want to go. And then we look at all options for funding. And I think that's, that's certainly got to be one in this community that we look at. Thank you so much for taking that ser my, my comment seriously because um, I, um, there's a lot of new folks in Santa Barbara who haven't been around for a long time and they've been maybe looking for ways to participate and get involved and to, you know, contribute. And for us to have those kinds of master plans and then show the community where they could contribute and participate, I think that would be really a great thing. And I think it would also go a long way for them to feel like they're part of the community and not just on the outside and, you know, concerned about how things are going. They could be part of the solution. Anyway, thank you very much. That's really good. Okay. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? It's really good. Thank you so lot. Uh, item number 12, please. Response to grand jury report regarding affordable housing. Okay, Mr. Falstich, is this yours? Or? Madam Mayor. Looks um, like it. <laughs> yes. 
Okay. I'm Stephen Falstish, the uh, city's housing program supervisor, and together with uh, Betty Weiss, uh, the city planner, ah. we crafted a draft response to the grand jury's um, recent report. There, um, they made several reports this year, but the civil grand jury um, made one that we need to respond to now, and it was called Affordable Housing in Santa Barbara County, Myth or Reality? Um, it was addressed to the county as well as the eight incorporated cities within the county and the city housing authority as well as the county housing authority, all of whom um, are required to respond in writing to each of the findings and recommendations in the report. So as I said, uh, staff has drafted a response letter from the mayor and council, and um, we uh, are looking for your response and any edits and authorization for the mayor to sign it on behalf of the council. All in all, the, um, the report was positive. It had some very nice things to say about the city's affordable housing programs in the preliminary um, comments, etc. And um, they also had a series of, of several findings as well as recommendations. The findings, which they said, um, and we either have to agree or disagree with them, um, one was that funding to subsidize affordable housing is limited and is not keeping place with the in pace with the increased costs of developing, uh, you know, the development and land. And of course, that's very true. Another finding, there are varying degrees of public and local government support of affordable housing programs across jurisdictions. Nonprofit organizations play an important role in affordable housing programs. And re regional housing needs numbers have not been met in most jurisdictions. And um, this is something that I'd like to spend a little time discussing. I know you're all familiar with the, um, the RENA allocation process. It's the Re Regional Housing Needs Allocation Process. And I'll give a little background. The State Department of Housing and Community Development allocates, um, they look at what the needs are, the projected needs for housing in the state to meet what uh, they think are going to be the demand for new housing units in, in a period of time. And they look at this by income group, either very low income, low income, moderate income, or everything else, um, especially market rate units. And uh, they, they also allocate this then by the counties. And then the counties, and we do it through our uh, Santa Barbara County Association of Governments with where we participate, SBCAG, the SBCAG allocates these numbers to the various cities and the unincorporated uh, county area. And then the cities are mandated to incorporate these RENA numbers into their housing elements. And in fact, we uh, have to have our housing elements certified by the state, and it won't be certified unless the city shows that the projected needs as reflected in these RENA allocations can be accommodated. Now that's a very important concept. It doesn't say that these housing units will be provided. It's that we have to show that we don't have governmental restraints, tight zoning, um, and other impediments to um, someone who wants to come and provide this housing. We have to show that we have zoning capacity and available sites for this. And um, that's especially true for the market rate housing. I mean, we have to review and, and approve the housing as consistent with our policies and, and our zoning, but we don't have to go get developers to come in and, and um, build the units. We just have to show that the capacity is there. Now, however, however for very low, low and uh, moderate income, the city does play an important role. That's because this housing would never get built without a lot of assistance in various forms, especially in uh, financial subsidies. So uh, I'm, I say, what has the city done since 2001? 2001 is the start of the current RENA allocation period, the target which goes from 2001 to 2008. So we haven't finished that yet. But since 2001, here's a table which shows the 12 projects that have um, provided units for very low income and low income persons. And total, um, we have financed 
386 very low income and low income units and provided grants and loans to these 12 projects to the tune of $32.8 million. So that's a substantial contribution, substantial commitment on the part of the city to assist these uh, affordable housing projects whenever possible. But there's a discrepancy between the city production and the RENA numbers. The Regional Housing Needs Assessment for very low and low income units in Santa Barbara City was 957 units. And as I just said, we actually produced so far in that period 386 units. The grand jury report characterizes this as a shortfall. And um, I'm not sure that's an accurate characterization. I mean, it's true that there's a difference, but there wasn't a stated mandate to produce those numbers. And in fact, when we look at a shortfall, Let's look at the subsidy shortfall. Recently, in the last couple of years, each one of those um, low income, very low income units has required a city subsidy of about $120,000. And that's really just a part of the, the picture because many of these projects also have relied on low income housing tax credits that are allocated through the state. For instance, the um, 51 unit project at 617 Garden Street by the, the um, housing, uh, by the Santa Barbara uh, Mental Health Association um, has received $7 million in low income housing tax credits. Would not have been possible without that $7 million plus the $5.1 million that the city provided. So if we just look at the city's portion here and see what subsidy would have been required to meet to be able to provide an extra 571 units, that's a shortfall of $68 million in, in available subsidies. And that is money that are it's just not available. I mean, in fact, the $32 million, we had to save up for that for, for many years for, for some of those projects. Um, and the grand jury acknowledged this. They know that, um, that the subsidy sources are are shrinking and, and that sort of thing. But the letter contains this language, um, and I think it's true. The shortfall speaks more to the unrealistic magnitude of the RENA allocations than to any shortfall in the city's performance. Now, as a, as in addition to the, um, uh, the findings, there's a series of recommendations, and the city has to respond to each of these and each of the jurisdictions do with the question of um, whether they're going to implement these recommendations, whether they already have implemented the recommendations, or whether they feel that they're not going to implement the recommendations for various reasons. And one of the recommendations is that jurisdictions should address the full range of housing needs rather than relying on one type of program. And the city's response in your draft letter is the city has implemented this recommendation. And the reason is that we've provided for many different types. One is the, um, that through the inclusionary housing ordinance, we're providing for middle income first time home buyers for work, who work on the South Coast. Now, admittedly, that's just a small fraction of the need, but we are not relying on one type of program. And in fact, we're continuing to look at ways to strengthen our affordable housing programs. And next week, I'll be before you with a series of recommendations that have been crafted through the Housing Policy Steering Committee and the Planning Commission for revisions to strengthen the inclusionary housing program. Um, we've also um, had programs that target low-income seniors, mentally ill clients at risk of homelessness, low-income downtown workers, and low-income families that need two, three, and four-bedroom units. So that's an example of the varying types of programs. Another um, grand jury recommendation is that we should focus more on very low and low income housing. When I say we, I mean this was a recommendation that was not um, crafted for the city of Santa Barbara, it was crafted for each of the, all of the jurisdictions together. And um, our response again is the city has implemented this, re this recommendation. Again, 386 units since 2001, nearly $33 million in city subsidies. 
and another recommendation the city should work with successful nonprofits and again the city has implemented this recommendation since two thousand and one you have approved loans and grants to the city housing authority laguna got cottages transition house people self help housing mercy housing california habitat for humanity the santa barbara mental health association santa barbara community housing corporation and others now i've already heard from uh, a couple of council members and with um, proposed response uh, revisions and um, and i'm sure we'll uh, <laughs> love to hear any other ideas um, with the council's direction we'll incorporate this in the letter as well uh, this is very true the area median income is set countywide but there are really two distinct housing markets with distinct demographics between them between the south county and the and the north county the needs are increasing but the resources aren't only not keeping up they're shrinking yeah. and in fact the section 8 program and community development block grant funding are really under attack by the current federal administration and um, I think counts uh, the Congress is is resisting cuts in those programs but um, they really are under um, attack they're being targeted and it's a, a very serious concern another serious concern is that uh, by operation of law our city's redevelopment agency will expire in 2015 and that's going to have a huge impact on our affordable housing programs um, this, the law allows us to still to collect limited tax increment just for the purpose of repaying existing housing debt and in, ta in anticipation of that we have issued bonds and that was a big source of funding on on some of our uh, recent projects um, through the redevelopment agency but um, it's something that we really have to pay attention to as well and also there's a typo on uh, page six number three which we will fix mm -hmm. and um, then um, and also a comment about um, being sure that we coordinate our response with the, the city's housing authority and we have been in contact and shared our draft um, ideas uh, with them and so you can be assured that uh, we're taking that to heart as well so in conclusion the title of the report is affordable housing in Santa Barbara County myth or reality and I can say that the city of Santa Barbara to together with many dedicated partners has been working hard for the past 30 years to make affordable housing in our city a reality so um, as I said um, Betty Weiss is, is here and um, if you have any questions or comments this would be great okay thank you Thank you, Mr. Foster. Um, Ms. Schneider. Mr. Horton. Thank you for that good report. And uh, it was last week, I believe, the City Housing Authority um, reviewed and adopted their version, their, their response. So that was on last week's agenda. Um, I guess I'm going to start with a question because I have a different interpretation of the same thing you wrote in here in terms of saying yes or no to a recommendation. And, and it's recommendation number two. It's on page four of the draft letter. When we say we will have implemented or we don't plan to implement, it, does the implementation have to be exactly what um, the recommendation is? And I, and I say it in that way because the, the recommendation says at least annually each jurisdiction shall, should hold informational community meetings to explain all aspects of its affordable housing program. The draft response says we don't plan to do it because we do all these other things. I would actually say we are Im implementing it in a slightly different and more comprehensive manner. Because, and then you list a variety of ways our, our redevelopment um, budget hearing every year going through every single affordable housing project online, dealing with um, how we dis use um, advertising to get people involved in the program, uh, our website and all the information on there. So in fact, I think not only have we implemented their recommendation, we've gone beyond their implementation, even though, so it's not exactly the way they worded it. Um, and I think it's important to say we're, we're responding to the, the underlying concern of what they're talking about, which is getting information out to the public. So my suggestion would be, and, and unless there's some technical reason why we couldn't do this, to change the first sentence and have it read, the city has implemented this recommendation in a different and more comprehensive manner, period, and then just go on with what you said. For example, and you list all the items. But that would be uh, my suggestion as a... 
mm -hmm. to, to change. And I like the other suggestions that were listed there earlier from council members, whoever that was, mm -hmm. whenever that was. So Cal thank you. Uh, Mayor Bloom mm -hmm. and council member Schneider. No, there is no reason that that couldn't be done. I think it's an excellent idea. And yeah. so. Good. Okay, Mr. Horton. Mr. Bernal. Um, I have some suggestions for you. Um, I think um, I think the response is is uh, is a good one, and generally I'm, I'm I'm perfectly supportive of it. But I think there's an area that perhaps uh, can help to answer some of these issues for us that you haven't really covered too much. And um, in the report, it mentions the uh, a county housing trust fund and. I actually am a chairman of the board of another type of housing trust fund, which is a, a 501c3 California nonprofit. And I think that um, groups such as this trust fund can work with the private sector, and, and by that I mean the businesses and the financial sector, the savings and loans and the banks, to come up with uh, new and creative ways of trying to address this problem. I also think that if we look in our um, our recent uh, history and our um, soon-to-come future, uh, we see um, a successful project at Westmont College. Uh, we see uh, UCSB with a, uh, a continuation set of projects. We see College Hospital with a project. And um, I can see um, uh, combinations of employers such as the research sector, um, you know, the uh, Silicon Beach uh, area that we're so proud of here that associates with UCSB. And I can see all of us um, working together as a, um, as a unified force, uh, developing money from the financial sector and working with the, um, the private sector to, to uh, produce some actual units on the ground. And I, I see enough uh, real practical uh, success in that to believe that uh, this, this may be one of the relief valves. Uh, I think it's it. Um, what it recognizes is that the the human factor in most of these firms is what their real value is. Uh, having the right kind of people, uh, of the right quality. I know I'm on the board of Sansom Clinic, and I know it's uh, it's difficult to even recruit um, high-level, competent physicians to this community because when when they come here and they see what they were used to in uh, Minneapolis or. Cleveland or something, they see what they can buy here. It just doesn't doesn't figure. So, I think if we um, not only do what we're doing here in the city, which I think is wonderful, and what the county's doing, but if we can focus on this uh, new area that I'm I'm trying to point out, uh, we may be able to uh, deliver some units uh, sooner, and uh, in a way that will uh, open up a whole new area of uh, financial resources to us. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Burnwell. I agree with what Mr. Horton is stressing right there. Two questions. Um, in the the 281 low income and the 105 very low income units that we've built, do we uh, mandate that the occupants of those either work and or already work and or live in the city of Santa Barbara? Or is like we do with our inclusionary housing or not? In other words, does the does the does the capital A affordable program mandate that the occupants of those units have to either work or live in the city of Santa Barbara? Which is isn't that a mandate for our inclusionary housing? Madam Mayor, Council Member Barnwell, um, that's that's a marketing preference at this point. It's not an absolute mandate. Okay. And, um, and the problem with the mandate of that sort comes when we start giving money to the projects. Um, and um, so I'm not aware that it's an absolute mandate from the city on any of these uh, low-income okay. units. I think that the Housing Authority implements a preference, a local preference on, on their units. I'm almost certain that they do. Um, and uh, that's going to be true for the Mental Health Association, for instance. I mean, those are going to be for people who are at risk of homelessness who are already in Santa Barbara. So uh, the, ma the mandates usually come from the providers of the housing rather than from the city. But working with the city attorney's office, I mean, it seems like that would be something to explore if, if, if it's at all possible. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
then is there a is there at any point along this discussion where we could um, support an opportunity to push for RDA extension? Is there some place in this document where in our discussion of the fact that RDA is sensating, we can add a clause, something to the effect that, and we would be supportive of or we, we, are, we are working toward or we would appreciate additional support in extending RDA's life because it's so important. I think adding something like that in there um, it, it just reinforces uh, both the success of how we've gotten to where we are and the utter disaster of what the future will be if we don't get another plan like RDA, as which everyone refers to as son of RDA. So thank you, Madam Mayor. Okay. Mr. House, then Ms. Falcone. Um, when this is uh, when this is done and submitted to um, to the grand jury, I understand this is going to be um, available on their web page for the public to view, and um, it seems that there should be um, perhaps uh, when we submit this, we could uh, include some links of our own that would then be uh, with a request that they'd be allowed to be active. Uh, I don't know if they would agree to that or not, but it would let us get uh, the a little bit more. Um, educational opportunity for those who have an interest because the city of Santa Barbara's uh, uh, current programs following through on the policies that have been generated over many years um, are um, pretty pretty amazing to behold and they need to be acknowledged as much as possible plus people again might want to find ways to participate or engage in the in, in our processes here in the city of Santa Barbara um, we are uh, also a city that has um, quite a number of rental units and there's always been a great concern of the, the potential loss of rentals um, when we see condo conversions and things like that but my understanding from the presentation that we had at the uh, Cabrillo Arts Center recently I think that's where I saw it the maybe it was before that but the the rental stock in terms of a percentage of our housing units has held pretty steady over the years I think 50 is it 8 percent or if it's somewhere in there and um, it's an interesting phenomenon you kind of wonder how that could be but there it is and I, um, the myth or reality part is sort of what I'm addressing here. Um, uh, rental is, uh, rentals, even market rate rentals, really provide opportunities that ownership might not for families and for uh, individuals. And I, uh, it seems like we should somewhere wiggle that into our, into our responses. Um, and it doesn't mean that we're sufficient in all those. We are still trying to do better. And I would hate for somebody to read this and think that we're all so happy with everything that we're just, that's kind of the end of it for us. That's not everything we're doing with the general plan update and all this. We're really trying to find more opportunities to even do a better job. So I hope that that comes through in our comments as well. Thank you very much. Okay. Ms. Falcone. Thank you. I'd like to reinforce a couple of different things. One is that on recommendation three, I think that we need to go a little bit further because when I read the uh, the comment by the grand jury that the jurisdiction should focus on developing more very low and low income housing to meet RENA goals, well, good grief. Um, I'm wondering what they're relying on. And I think your response is, is good, but I think it needs to also include that over the life of the RDA, and this goes to Mr. Barnwell's point a little bit, that we have Actually, I think at this point the number is 13 percent of the entire housing stock of the 38,000 plus units that we have in the city limits. 13 percent of that is held in affordable housing with restrictions managed largely by the housing authority. But I think that needs to be mentioned, that we have a long history of implementing this goal. and. Uh, it's fine to cite this current uh, period that we're in, but I think it, we need to go beyond and say we've, we've been there all along. We've been a leader in the state. Uh, another one is to Mr. Barnwell's comment with regard to RDA extension. Every year there seem to be a couple of bills that are promoted that have to do with either extending your current RDA or uh, some other mechanism by which we can continue to do the good works that we do through that through that um, um, that mechanism is there any bill that's still alive that you know of is there 
Is there something hanging fire out there that we could maybe encourage the grand jury and maybe we could and through other efforts uh, become engaged in? Uh, Madam Mayor and Council Member uh, Falcone, uh, Dave Gustafson is up at the uh, the California Redevelopment Association Legal Issues Symposium right. as he we is. speak. Yeah. And uh, right. so right. although I'm not aware of the latest mm -hmm. uh, legislation, okay. I'm sure he will be by the time he comes back. Good. So well, I we'll hope we get, uh, we get a memo uh, upon his return about what nifty ideas he's uh, been able to Glean. Um, the other one is Mr. Horton's comment, and that has to do with the partnerships between governments, employers, nonprofits, developers, the public private partnerships. There are scads of um, examples that we can point to. I'm not suggesting that we point to each one of them. I'm <laughs> suggesting that we make a slightly larger emphasis on the fact that we have also been looking for every opportunity and had a, a great number of successes in these various different types of partnerships. Sometimes I'm thinking of City College, it's a private developer who is building a project over off of Cliff Drive that City College has actually agreed to purchase um, the vast majority of the in the the um, condos as opposed to the houses on the hill uh, for their their faculty and uh, I don't think we have any money in that though no we don't but allowing building to go up on that hill I think is you know certainly something that not all of us were happy to see, <laughs> to, to see although it was a necessary thing to do um, the last comment that I have has to do with Rena, and just to, to, to let people know and I've mentioned this before that the Rena process has a great deal uniform uh, anguish throughout the state is expressed with the RENA program by local jurisdictions, particularly cities. And so there is a tremendous amount of discussion at the state on real reform. Now, the administration isn't particularly eager to enter into reform, but I think the more we go ahead and continue to press those points, that the RENA one-size-fits-all program does not work for every jurisdiction. There needs to be either some flexibility or some, some kind of, so I think we can ask the grand jury to, to help us get that message across because it's one of the, the, the conversations at the, at the League of California Cities that when engaged in, there's universal disappointment and aggravation with the program throughout the entire state. Um, the last thing is when you get to the median, uh, the median uh, income that drives all of our affordable small A or <coughs> is that capital A or small A? I can never remember. Anyway, the, the, the low and very low moderate income, uh, that's what sort of drives who can get in there. Now, the federal government, HUD, sets that, and I'm not quite sure if we've ever asked anybody at like Lois's office or somewhere else to look into this idea when you say that there are two different planning regions and that HUD sets it on a county-wide. It's been talked about for many years and it has up starts and stops, but to actually get HUD to look at regional planning areas as opposed to county boundaries, it's regional planning areas, and in our region, that would be the South Coast, would be a sensible regional planning area upon which to do a median income. And it would be more real than the way they currently do it. Now, I don't know if that we've ever engaged in that, but maybe this is an opportunity to, to bring that up and to try to get some motion, because if, if we tell the grand jury things that we think are helpful that they can engage in and help us to do, maybe that sets some things in motion that we wouldn't do just on our own. So I know that's kind of a lot, but uh, thank you. It's a great response, by the way. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I think we couldn't Madam, use a motion. Madam Mayor? Yes. Oh, I just so thought I should, sure, go ahead. maybe should mention something mm -hmm. with respect to the comments from Councilmember Barnwell and Councilmember Falcone about the the desire to extend the life of the RDA. Yeah. Um, in a way, that's not the precise problem 
that we have. Uh, the immediate problem, if you will, and this came up, I think, a few weeks ago in, in a uh, report given by the Redevelopment Agency by Dave Gustafson. The immediate problem is the existence of what's called the total tax increment cap. Uh, in 1986, the state, the, it was the, to my knowledge, the first real legislation where the state started cutting back on RB, RDAs and in required RDAs, among other things, to impose some limits, a, a total tax increment cap on the amount of uh, tax increment it would collect over the life of a project area. And at that time, and for a longest period of time, we understood that the CCRP, our project area, was going to end this month, August of 2007. And so when we, in 1986, did our progression, uh, the, the finance director calculated how much total tax increment we would collect, and she uh, did a progression on it, she had no idea that the CCRP was actually because of all the different things that have happened with ERAF and extensions, the CCRP now won't end until 2015. We're going to we're going to in a few years be at our to total tax increment cap, and we'll be able to pay off our existing indebtedness. We've dealt with that, um, but if and I bring this up because if there's a way to lobby for change whether it's at the league or at the CRA, it really is respect to this. For example, a few years ago, in I'm dealing with another um, state-imposed limit. That was the date by which we could no longer incur indebtedness. And that was either a year or two ago. I can't remember exactly. Was it two years ago? We were able to change the state legislation to exempt affordable housing. So we can still incur debt, as Mr. Falstich mentioned. We can still incur long-term indebtedness for affordable housing and use our tax increment as a, as a, a funding source for that debt, but that doesn't solve the total tax increment cap problem. And that's, the, but that, that's an example of our ability to convince the state to make that change in our, in our incurring indebtedness date. It, it was no, it was not controversial. They said, oh, affordable housing certainly will make that change. Mm -hmm. and, and it just does, it's occurred to many of us that possibly Sacramento would be amenable to allowing the total tax increment cap to be exceeded for the purposes of affordable housing. And you're right, though, in, we don't want the CCRP to end in 2015 so long as the CR CCRP is being used to uh, subsidize affordable housing. Yeah, good point, Steve. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay, good. Yeah, that's, that's a good argument. <laughs> okay. I think we're going to need a motion um, to authorize the mayor to sign and send the letter. So moved. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. We have one more. Um, sub Thank you, Mr. Foster. Go ahead and read number 13. Closed session for conference with legal counsel regarding pending litigation. Okay. And we, we will uh, adjourn out of that. Okay? Yes, Madam Mayor, there's, mm -hmm. there's a chance that there yeah, will be a reporting out required on this. And we can either do that by just shortly uh, reconvening and then reporting out verbally, okay. or we can uh, if possibly put it in the minutes, have the reporting out in the minutes. So. Oh, okay. If we can report out in the minutes, that would be better probably. Okay. Okay. And I wanted to uh, um, make sure that we adjourn later on um, in honor of John Pittman, who died yes. this last week. He... Uh, uh, he passed away, but he had the mission overflowing this morning for his uh, service, and it was uh, very touching to see everybody there. He is, he is a, quite an architect in Santa Barbara, and we had yeah. just approved that uh, Jurgensen Ranch, which is where he was one of the first houses he designed in Santa Barbara, yeah. and he did it before he was an architect. So I thought it was uh, kind of fitting in some ways that we approved that. and. He was named an associate of the AIA, and Bill Mahan this morning said that um, that means he was a cardinal in the <laughs> architectural <laughs> world. <laughs> he was in the mission, so that's why it came to his brain like that. But uh, J John Pittman, a very good man, a very kind man, and I enjoyed working with him. He was born in 1930, so he lived a long life all in Santa Barbara, Cottage Hospital all the way through. So good for him, and we will miss him greatly. Thank you.